Okay, uh, welcome to the second part of the deformations course. So the, what I will be talking about is mostly the so-called TT bar deformation. Uh, and uh, essentially I will focus on this for uh, this lecture and the next. And then in the last one, I will change topic a little bit and talk about integrable models. And then at the end, tell you how the TT bar deformation fits into this story. But uh, just as an introduction, so let me talk a, a bit about what happens when you try to perturb your CFT. Now, not uh, with a marginal operator, as Marco t told us, but with a relevant or irrelevant operator. Okay, and I, I just remind you that, the, so the definition is that when this is less than two, this is a relevant operator. And irrelevant when it's greater than two, and I'm switching back to the notations that are used mostly in the two-dimensional case. So this will be the same deltas and delta bars as in the first course. Uh, so, okay, so the first, let's start with the case where the, we consider a relevant perturbation. The first obvious observation is that uh, we lose scale invariance because, uh, so now lambda will be a dimensionful parameter. And uh, well, if you just do a scale transformation, then, by in naive analysis, you discover that this is equivalent to changing lambda. To a redefined lambda in this way. So essentially, this tells you that when you zoom in to short distances, it's equivalent to taking lambda smaller. And uh, so naively, the initial CFT controls the short distance behavior of this new theory, if we can define it. Well, but it is possible to do it, and uh, I don't want to go into the details of conformal perturbation theory, but just to give you an idea, uh, essentially the behavior of the singularities that you would find in this case, it's uh, even, so it's better, it's more regular than in the case of marginal perturbations that Marco considered. And uh, so, for example, let us consider the correction to a correlator. And this, okay, at first order would be given by a certain in insertion of the, of the perturbing field. Well, and then you need to do the OPE of these two. Let's say this field has dimension delta one, and you produce a new field with dimension delta two. And if you look uh, what are the singularities that are, so what, which of these terms can produce a singularity? So you find that the condition would be the delta two has, been, has to be less or equal than delta plus delta one minus one. So it has to be lower than the dimension of delta one in particular, because delta minus one is a negative number. In Markov's case, this was zero. So this is, our, is a very well organized the structure of singularities and in the language that may be familiar of perturbative quantum field theory, this is a renormalizable perturbation theory. So essentially, you will get a continuum quantum field theory that is no longer scale invariant. And if you study how it evolves with scales, you find an RG flow that 
tells you that the theory in the UV is controlled by the original CFT. And then in the IR at long distances, it will have a different behavior. So typically, you expect that it would flow to a second CFT, perhaps. Or maybe this CFT will be trivial, and then you have to study the massive modes, and you can describe the IR in terms of a scattering theory of particles with masses. So, and also something that you can see in this case is that uh, in this quantum field theory, the space of operators is essentially isomorphic to the space of operators of the original CFT. Large, oh yes, yeah, sure. So now let's try with an irrelevant operator and we'll take this example. So we try to deform it with an operator that is T times T bar, the chiral and antichiral components of the stress energy tensor, and you see that this has dimension four. Uh, well, essentially, what I just wrote is incomplete. It doesn't make sense because the perturbation theory here would be non-renormalizable. So you see, if you analyze the structure of singularities, you see that singular terms come now from operators, in this case, that have dimension higher than the operator appearing in the correlator that you are studying. And loop by loop, you find new types of singularities appearing involving operators of higher and higher dimensions. So essentially, what you can do here is just uh, trying to perturbatively push the divergences at higher orders. Uh, but essentially, it, it's, it's the framework of effective quantum field theories, of non-renormalizable quantum field theory. So this action just tells you that at long distances, the theory will somehow will converge to your original CFT. But then, of course, uh, because you have so many divergences, you have uh, um, essential ambiguities to specify loop by loop. And this uh, essentially is because there are infinitely many trajectories that arrive at the fixed point along uh, this direction which is a physical feature. This is essentially universality that tells you that no matter the short distance behavior, many different models converge and gain the universal behavior described by the CFT. So what I'm going to discuss uh, in the rest of this lecture and the next, it's uh, the so-called TT bar deformation, which is something different from this and uh, would be something defined uh, non-perturbatively. Uh, so if you, if you want a way to specify, so it would be one of, the, of these possible flows described by a non-perturbative non equation that essentially would give you the tangent vector at each point. Uh, and uh, so this tangent vector is defined by an operator that was uh, defined by Zamologikov that uh, I will call, uh, I will denote in this way. And uh, it is uh, in a way that I will make more precise, it's the determinant of the stress energy tensor. And essentially, Zamologikov showed that in a certain sense, this is, uh, you can define it. Uh, in, a, in any quantum field theory. And uh, so we will define a deformed action that depends on a parameter lambda. <coughs> through this equation. So this would be this operator uh, but evaluated on a 
point of the flow, so on the deformed theory. It's not the TT bar operator of the CFT. Uh, well, so this, uh, this particular, uh, the idea to consider this deformation has uh, arisen in the context of integrable models. And, but then, and I will not explain uh, in the last lecture how this appears uh, as a deformation that preserves integrability. But uh, because the TT bar operator is universal, essentially you can apply this deformation to any CFT and also to starting from uh, any quantum field theory. Uh, and so we will see that uh, it, essentially it is also a solvable deformation in a sense that it's independent uh, of integrability. So for many physical quantities, you can write down some exact equations that tell you how they are deformed uh, for finite values of the deformation parameter alpha. And then there are a lot of natural questions like, uh, does this deformation have any physical meaning? And what are the natural observables of this theory? So for example, does the deformed theory admit uh, the concept of local operators. Uh, another natural question might be, what happens if you take ADS CFT and apply this deformation to the CFT that appears there? And uh, so these are all questions that are uh, subject of uh, on the object of active research, and there are various proposals that have appeared in the last years, and I will just uh, mention some of them, but I, I want to focus on the on the, on the simple things. Uh, so I want to start by defining what is the, this uh, TT bar operator, and then I will uh, describe how to use it to deform, this, deform a theory, and how to compute various quantities in the deformed theory. So let me make some comments. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, it would it would be a different CFT. So, essentially, because uh, CFTs are fixed point of the renormalization group flows, so they attract the uh, trajectories. Yeah. But of course, in principle, you you have no idea what what's the IR CFT. Okay. Yes. Uh, it is very important. So otherwise you cannot define this uh, TT bar operator. Okay, so we, to, to define it, we have an, other questions? Okay, so we'll use the stress energy tensor of the theory. So I need to tell you how to define the stress energy tensor when you don't have uh, an action so you cannot use Noether's theorem. And, uh, okay, <laughs> the definition that we have in mind is that the, you imagine that you can couple the theory to a metric, and the stress energy tensor is, uh, controls how the theory responds to variations in this background metric. So if you have uh, some correlator, make a variation with respect to a metric at a different point from these insertions. This is well with it's given a, a correlator with the stress energy tensor inserted. And uh, so you don't yes. This is meant to be something that works in a QFT as opposed to a I mean not necessarily a CFT. Yes, this is yeah, exactly. Uh, 
And uh, well, you don't need to think about uh, really putting the theory on a curved background because it's enough uh, to think of uh, changes of coordinates that uh, will redefine the metric. Uh, well, so in QFT, this equation tells you that there will be a, an important difference with respect to CFT because if you consider the trace of the stress energy tensor that, uh, okay, I would call theta, maybe there's a factor one over four, this measures three scalings. So this is an, the trace is an operator that in CFT is zero when you insert it into, inside any correlation function. Uh, but uh, so since we need to define this uh, TT bar operator at the generic point, and once we switch on this deformation, we will break uh, conformal invariance. So we will need to use a generic stress energy tensor that will have a non-vanishing trace. Okay, so to define this operator, I will, I will use uh, complex coordinates from now on. So let me just remind you that uh, I will use this notation for T and T bar, and the trace is just T, Z, Z bar. Okay, so we want to define it as a determinant, so this will be in a certain sense, t t bar minus theta squared. But of course, uh, so this doesn't make sense because we are multiplying fields at the same points. So we, to see how to regularize this, we can consider a, a point-splitted version of this. So a combination of fields at two points Okay, and we want to study this object. So we will use the, the equations of motion that in complex coordinates, are these. And uh, so I'll just point out that I'm using uh, Z here, but this doesn't mean that I'm assuming holomorphicity for these fields. It's just a notation for a point on a two-dimensional plane. Okay. So and then, we, so we want to study how this object changes if we vary the separation of the two points. So let me take coordinates like this, where W will be the separation. And I want to take a derivative with respect to W. Well, okay, so this will be even by this, and then I can use the equations of motion. So I get T of Z derivative with respect of to W bar of theta minus theta of Z derivative with respect to W bar of theta. And then you, you see that, uh, okay, I interpret this derivative with respect to W bar as a derivative with respect to Z here, and I try to rewrite it as a total derivative. Okay. 
uh, this is Z bar. Is that right? uh, yeah, and this one, so this was W bar, because I'm using the first equation. Well, this should be T, yes. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So this was W and this was T. Yes, thanks. Well, and you can rewrite it like this because you see that the cross terms cancel. So what, how do we interpret this equation? Essentially, we've seen that the derivative with respect to W, that was the separation, we translated into a derivative with respect to Z and Z bar, which is a total translation of this object. Uh, so there are some interesting consequences. So for example, we can try to study the OPE of this object now if we bring the two points together. So uh, it's bigger. bigger, yes. Well, So let's assume that this is the OPE of these two fields, which in a generic theory, which is a local quantum field theory, will, uh, so will no longer be regular if we bring them together. The singularities in the expansions are in, in these coefficients. Well, and then you can check that if you plug these two expansions into this equation, so you see that the, these derivatives kill these terms. So it, it means that there must be a very, a very big cancellations between the terms into these two expansions. And the only terms that uh, are allowed to survive with some coefficient which is not one or proportional to one, are terms where the operator appearing here is a total, the total derivative. Well, th there is some regular term plus some terms with some singular coefficients and, and total derivatives. So in this sense, so this uh, composite field is not really an operator. It's just defined uh, modular derivatives. But this is good enough for us. Because uh, actually what we need is we want to deform the action with an integral of this operator. So the total derivative don't matter. And so actually, um, so we use the OPE, but uh, this is uh, something that applies for a uh, quantum field theory, which is a, a good local theory, and which is controlled at short distances by a CFT. As we, as we will see, this is no longer the case for the deformed theory. So this really, it's not applicable to the situation that's interesting for us. 
So, but we can uh, derive some more non-local consequences from this equation still. So if you consider, for example, the expectation value of this uh, uh, bi-local field in some, uh, any geometry which is translation invariant, so I will think of an infinite cylinder, or you can think of the torus. You see that that equation implies that if you separate the two operators, this is equivalent to a translation, and uh, this doesn't depend on translations. So essentially, this really behaves like a one-point function. And now we, we will use this fact to evaluate the expectation value of this TT bar operator on the cylinder. So we consider an infinite cylinder. And uh, so it, it is useful, uh, to, it would be useful to switch to a Hamiltonian picture where we quantize the cylinder on these slices of radius r. And uh, I will introduce coordinates which are called uh, x1 and x0 here. So, uh, well, so we said that this, uh, this expectation value doesn't depend on the separation of the two points. But then you can uh, take them infinitely far apart because the cylinder is infinitely long. And then you can assume that uh, at long distances, correlation functions factorize if you take fields that are uh, very far away from each other. So this will be just this object. And now we just need to evaluate one-point functions on the cylinder of components of the stress-energy tensor. OK, so to do this, let's switch to this Hamiltonian picture, where uh, um, so I will quantize the system on these uh, slides, slices. I will denote as h the Hamiltonian operator that uh, gives translations along the time direction, and p will be the operator that rotates around the cylinder, translates around the cylinder. Uh, well, this, uh, the expectation value on the cylinder in the Hamiltonian picture is thus the expectation value in the ground state in this quantization. Uh, so in, to evaluate these matrix elements, uh, I, I will switch to Cartesian coordinates because it's simpler. So apart from factors of 1 over 4 or similar, so this will be this object, and we need to evaluate these uh, expectation values. So. For this, we use that the Hamiltonian is essentially given by, so it's the integral of the component T0,0 of the stress energy tensor. And the momentum is given by the integral on the special slice of the component T01. So this tells us what are some of these matrix elements already. So we find that uh, T00, so because this uh, doesn't depend on the insertion point on the cylinder, this integral is just R times this number. So this is just, well, I think actually you have uh, some minus signs here. 
so this will be equal to minus the energy of the ground state on the cylinder that depends on the radius of the cylinder over R. And similarly, this will be, well, and for the ground state, this will be zero. But soon we'll, we'll generalize it to the case of uh, states with non-zero momentum. It would be zero because the total momentum of the ground set is zero. And then, okay, what about this one? So to evaluate this one, we use this relation of the stress energy tensor to variation shown in the metric. So this will corresponds to uh, taking variations of the component G11 that measures the size of the cylinder. So because essentially this measures the, how the Hamiltonian varies if you vary the size of the cylinder. This will be the derivative with respect to the size of the eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian. And uh, so you can generalize all of this. So before uh, writing the final result, let me generalize it first. You can study also more general diagonal matrix element of this operator. Well, let me just write like this. And you can check, it's important that they are diagonal because only if they are diagonal, then we can use this argument about translation invariance. So and this, uh, again, would be given by a product of one point function. And then, well, we get one over R times times the, the product of the eigenvalues of the momentum that can be non-zero in a generic state. Also, let me make a comment that the eigenvalues of the momentum need to be uh, need to be uh, quantized in integers because if you translate the system once around the cylinder, you need to get back. So you need to get one. Okay, so given this result, let, uh, the first thing that we'd like to study is uh, now I'll show you how to apply this to derive uh, how the energy levels are deformed in this uh, TT bar deformation. Yes. Uh, yeah, so because, so I, yeah, n, n is a state defined on these slices, and it's an eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian. So it, it evolves just with a phase. Yeah. Let me, let me think. No, because so this matrix element, uh, so this one is going to be in a generic state. This is going to be I times Pn R because, uh, yeah, that, 
That's it, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm. The cylinder is just a piece of the plane with some period, some boundary periodic, some identification, and I, I made this derivation just uh, taking derivatives uh, in flat coordinates. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, this one, yeah, Th thanks. Thank you. Well, we don't want to do it. We don't, we don't want to study correlators. Um, well, uh, yeah, the, yes, so the question is, uh, in this case, I cannot map correlators from the plane to the cylinder because I don't have a conformal invariance and I, I cannot use a conformal map. And uh, the answer is that uh, I'm not uh, doing that. I'm just working on the cylinder. And uh, what I derived above about this operator and the fact that you can uh, uh, that separation is equal to translations, I could have derived it directly on the cylinder. Well, I, I, I didn't tell you how, where, I, where I was, where I derived it. I was just working in some local system of coordinates and I have one on the cylinder. Okay, I, I, I think that's the answer. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So f let's say for the moment uh, we are in a standard quantum field theory, and then you will have that uh, at long distances uh, correlated with factorized. But then these uh, deformations that we do is, is an irrelevant deformation, so it will not change the behavior at long distances. So you can say that this will continue to be true. And I, so. I can s even along any point of this deformation, I can still use this formula for the expectation value of TT bar. Okay. <laughs> so, but. So before uh, studying the energy uh, on, in the deformed theory, I want to study, to try to see what is uh, this deformation classically. So I want to take a very simple theory, the, the, so the free boson and uh, try to apply this equation. And now uh, I just interpret it, this equation that, uh, so I, I'll just repeat it. And uh, I'm putting an index alpha here just to remind you that I should uh, really evaluate this operator on the deformed theory at finite value of the parameter alpha. 
So classically, this is just a differential equation. That, uh, so I need to impose the boundary conditions that uh, the initial action is, is, for example, the free boson action in this case. And then, OK, we are classical, so I'll, I'll just use uh, uh, the Noether's theorem for the stress energy tensor. And uh, I will compute it like this. So, well, if you start from this action, you compute T, you find that uh, it's essentially d phi squared. And T bar would be T bar phi squared. And T is 0 because it is a conformer. So then you can start perturbatively. This uh, S of alpha. It will start like, uh, let's call this uh, S0. And uh, well, let me, uh, I think for consistency, I'll, well, no, I'll keep it with a plus. So. Okay, and then you try. You can. You have to compute uh, all other corrections because once you add this term, and you recompute the stress energy tensor. You will get a new term. So, for example, this action will give you now a theta at order alpha. Where so theta would be essentially. So you need to continue and iterate it. So if you do the next term, you find, well, there will be some number here that I don't remember, alpha squared. And then some term like this, where you, you get powers of your original Lagrangian, and so on. OK, and then. Uh, let me copy what you get once you resum it. OK, and you get this action with the square root. And uh, OK, so this action, essentially, it's a Nambugoto action in, in a particular gauge. So, we, so if you consider a, a bosonic string that, yes. How, it, how you get these corrections? Yeah. So, well, you see, let, suppose you have uh, only this. Then you want to check if this uh, satisfies your differential equation. So you need to plug it in. And then, so you need to compute uh, TT bar of the right-hand side. But uh, so TT bar of this action, so forget about this. You will get something at order alpha. 
or actually alpha squared. So it means uh, that you need to cor you need to correct your actions with other terms that will give you this term once you take the derivative, and so on. So it cannot truncate. You you need to have infinitely many orders, and uh, the solution is this: you can check that this satisfies the differential equation. Well, so this is, corresponds to a bosonic string that propagates in a three-dimensional space-time in a certain gauge. So, where, so if you take a string that propagates in a target space with coordinates like this, and then uh, so you have... Uh, the Nambugoto action will be like this, and you want to choose a gauge where uh, you identify, which is called a static gauge, where uh, you simply take You fix your, you fit your coordinates to the, your worksheet coordinates to the target space coordinates, and uh, the last coordinate would just be phi, essentially. Well, it would be proportional to alpha phi, I think. Well, then uh, square root of alpha phi. And then you see that this action becomes exactly this one. And uh, well, and, and alpha is alpha prime in the string string theory, essentially. Uh, this could be a point to start okay. concluding. How much do I have? Uh, yeah, let's say one minute. Less one minute. Yeah. Okay. That, I think it's a good point to. I mean, if you want to make some minute. comments or. Uh, well. Uh, so the result is mind-boggling already, so maybe it doesn't need any comment. No, okay, let's continue tomorrow. <laughs> let's thank Andrea. <laughs> well, there is time for some questions. Well, the, the the form spectrum would be the exactly the spectrum of the string. The, yeah. But then, so you essentially you can ask. So you you will get a spectrum that is the spectrum that you get in light cone quantization of the string, and you know that uh, in d different from twenty six. Uh, so this is not supposed to be compatible with uh, target space uh, Lorentz invariance. So, but this, so from this point of view, you get a particular quantization of this action where you, you have a two-dimensional point of view. You don't know about the target space, and it gives you exactly this spectrum. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it comes from here. So uh, this uh, proof that I did of the fact that TT bar is a well-defined operator of modulo derivatives, it, it applies to the products of any two currents that you have. So then you can study if you have two currents, J J bar or a J T bar, which is a more radical deformation because JT bar would break uh, Lorentz invariance or rotation invariance. But yeah. Uh, 
Well, yes, but uh, I haven't thought about it yet. Yeah. Any more questions? Maybe I have a small comment. I mean, this is really, if you take the polyform action and you fix the gauge, is literally what, what you would get. Actually, not exactly that gauge, uh, you would miss the minus one, but with a slightly different gauge, mm -hmm. you would really get that. And that's, that's in principle how you quantize it. Yes, I think in the cases where you can, there's a theory quantize the theory. Okay. Mm -hmm. No further questions, and let me quickly do a few announcements.